Thank you, Brother Bradford. Brother Oswald, if no one is feeling well this early, on a cold Saturday morning, why was I scheduled to speak first? I'm a bit concerned about that. Just a sub-note about farms. Brothers and sisters, we're familiar with the remarkable Book of Mormon research, other things they're doing with the Book of Abraham, the marvelous way that they keep each of us on our toes scholastically as they perform that which they do so well. But I'm not sure that uh, many of us fully understand what Farms is doing in this whole area of temples and what's going on there. Farms has published 27 major articles and papers about temples. along with three books about them, and has sponsored three symposiums, of which this morning is one of them. A recent editorial titled A Nudge Can Change History concentrated upon the events in history when reviewed over time were truly significant in altering life from what it would have been had those events not occurred. Several events were mentioned, such as the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the event of 20 years ago when Iranian students held American hostage in Tehran, and then a number of events about 20 years ago, some a little sooner than that, when the Soviet Union was uh, misbehaving a bit, whether they were poised to invade Afghanistan, or the tanks that were rolled in place along the Iron Curtain in Germany. Those were significant events. Had they turned out differently, the history of Europe and much of the world would uh, be different today. However, something far greater than any past nudges of this century or many past centuries, is when President Gordon B. Hinckley began this remarkable focus upon temple building and temple activity, bringing the number of announced under construction or dedicated temples as of this morning to 115. These temples are located in 36 nations, and in 32 states plus the District of Columbia. Consider this. Temples change our entire viewpoint and perspective of mankind and ourselves in that it focuses us to persistently think about what we may become eternally. I'd like to talk a bit about some of the convergences that are taking place right now. Around 1997, just a little more than two years ago, ideas began to gel that the Internet could possibly be a helpful tool for ham family history research and all that is attached to it. Elder Monty J. Bruff, who was then leading the Family History Department as the executive director, conceived the general design of Family Search Internet. Interestingly, the presiding brethren approved the concept with almost immediate unanimity. I also might add that does not happen often. The department then worked with IBM and JLM Technologies, a rapid application development group, now called LavaStorm, to make the concept a reality as quickly as possible. They were wildly optimistic that one million hits per day might someday be reached. Incidentally, a hit is defined as each time a major component of an Internet page is accessed by a user. The church did not know exactly how much traffic there would be on the website and so ran a test for several weeks to gauge the demand and to make refinements to the system. Amazingly, on the first official day of the beta test, 
there were 3.7 million hits, some four times more than we had expected would be occurring in the future. During the beta test, the traffic settled into about 5 million hits per day, and based on that volume, it was determined to equip a system capable of handling 25 million hits per day. Despite such capability, in the hours just after the launch on May 24th, traffic became so intense that our computers were unable to serve everyone who wanted access. Indeed, the system became so overloaded that it was necessary to ration time so that all users could be served even though they needed to wait for a certain quarter hour time frame to access the information they wanted. We can now measure not only the number of hits but also the actual number of visitors to the site each day. Since the addition of 240 million new names to the site's uh, database on November 22nd, just several weeks ago, we are seeing 120,000 visitors and 9 million hits per day. Altogether, since May 24th, we have had over 1.8 billion hits, or 26 million hits to the site. One feature of the system allows the users to submit their genealogical information to the church electronically via the Internet. We are currently receiving from them about a million names per month. We now have 640 million names on Family Search Internet, and we anticipate this number will greatly expand over the months and years ahead. Elijah must be pleased with the unique assignment that our Heavenly Father gave to him. As the Lord communicated to Joseph Smith, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. And, of course, that's in the second section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Incidentally, brothers and sisters and friends, I know of no other scripture than this one that is found in all four of the standard works. Yes, the spirit of Elijah is alive and well and very active. Inasmuch as we are living during the most concentrated era of temple building in the history of this world, and inasmuch as the reconstruction of the Nauvoo Temple, perhaps the most commented upon, and unique temple of them all has begun, I shall address some interesting situations relating to temple building activity of the present while focusing upon Nauvoo and dates of significance pertaining to it. Prior to the Nauvoo period, however, let us look to some of that which happened in Kirtland, Ohio, as the saints settled there and in Missouri. Joseph Smith received 46 revelations in Kirtland, as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, and there were sound reasons, as we all know, for this rich spiritual outpouring during this time of upheaval, conflict, and misunderstanding. We are familiar with the fact that the first temple in the age of the Restoration was built in Kirtland, Ohio, as the Lord instructed in 1832. The Kirtland Temple was dedicated on March 27th of 1836 with 416 members attending the service. Incidentally, I have just come from Winter Quarters last Sunday where we had our groundbreaking for the temple that already has begun to be constructed there. Wednesday, Thursday, and part of yesterday I was in Edmonton Alberta, Canada, at the open houses, preparing for the dedication there. Here we are in a temple symposium, and then within a few days back to uh, Canada where the dedication 
of the Edmonton Temple will take place. Can you imagine what's going on everywhere if those events are happening to us in just one area? Moving along, and going back to the uh, Kirtland Temple, with the 416 members attending the service, we had more neighbors than that attend the open house just a few days ago that live around the Edmonton Temple. It was there at Kirtland where Brother George A. Smith stood to prophesy by reporting when a noise was heard like the sound of a rushing mighty wind which filled the temple and all the congregation simultaneously arose being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Others saw glorious visions. And I beheld, said he, the temple filled with angels. Which fact I declared to the congregation. The people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple and were astonished at that which was taking place. They continued until the meeting closed at 11 p.m. When we think of that unique building, we recollect the prophet Joseph and Oliver Cowdery being given the needed keys for temple activity when they saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit. He stated, among other things, for behold, I have accepted this house and my name shall be here. Moses then appeared, committing to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery the keys of the gathering of Israel. Elias made himself manifest and committed to them the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. Incidentally, a paper could be done on that fascinating topic. Next, Elijah, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, appeared in another great and glorious vision and said, Behold, the time is fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, we know that process, the assignment he had of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. This is when the keys of the sealing power were given to bind on earth that which is bound in heaven. The keys of this dispensation were committed into their hands, and it appears that the purposes for which the Kirtland Temple had been built at such sacrifice was fulfilled. A chapter closed. Severe problems and extensive persecutions persisted and increased, causing a mammoth exodus from the Kirtland, Ohio area. Serious life-threatening challenges had been the lot of the saints in Missouri. During that time, up until 1839, when those members of the church finally settled in Commerce, Illinois, soon to be renamed Nauvoo. If one is familiar, brothers and sisters, with a few of the dates and several events that occurred in Nauvoo, then the remarkable effect that Nauvoo has upon us all will be more clearly understood. These events define some of the reasons why the Nauvoo Temple has elicited such extensive interest in the church and elsewhere. And here are the dates that I feel are most important pertaining to that temple. In September of 1840, the first proxy work was performed since ancient days when baptisms for the dead were accomplished in the Mississippi River right there in the bend of the river where Nauvoo is located. Now each year, approximately 7 million baptisms for the dead are performed. Last year, there were 7,717,409 temples, pardon me, baptisms for the dead, and soon there will be over 10 million a year. The next date is October 3rd of 1840, when Joseph Smith announced the building of a house of the Lord with the conference accepting that proposal. Reynolds Cahoon and Alpheus Cutler were named as supervisors of construction with Elias Higby as the project manager. Sometime during the fall of 1840, Joseph Smith accepted a design by William Weeks, whose home in a restored condition remains in Nauvoo today. 
The prophet caused Weeks to revise the design of the temple on several occasions. It appears Joseph Smith became the overall designer of the temple as it began and at least till the time when it was halfway completed. He was a hands-on leader, but perhaps never more than during the initial period of the building of the temple at Nauvoo. On January 19th of 1841, the Lord revealed what is now the 124th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Some of the reasons for and purposes of the temple were defined at that time. The requirements to build, and I found this fascinating, a Jackson County temple was rescinded, and interestingly enough, in this same revelation, was given a direction to construct a hotel in Nauvoo. March 1841, the foundation stones of the Nauvoo temple were positioned in the four corners, and basement walls were also put in place. During the next month, on April 6th of 1841, the date we love so much, the temple cornerstones were laid. Then in November of 1841, a temporary baptismal font made of wood was dedicated. Those using the baptismal font were required to present a receipt communicating the fact that they were tithe payers, probably the first form of a temple recommend that was used. May 4th and 5th of 1842, the prophet Joseph administered the first endowments to a, f a few individuals in the upper room of the red brick store. September 1st, the prophet communicated a need for a recorder to be an eyewitness of your baptisms with the statement that in all your recordings it may be recorded in heaven. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth may be bound in heaven. The very scripture we've heard about so often. Going on, the statement was made, for I am about to restore many things to the earth. Pertaining to the priesthood, saith the Lord of hosts, and again let all the records be had in order, that they may be put in the archives of my holy temple, to be in remembrance from generation to generation. Parenthetically, let me add here, brothers and sisters, that, that uh, now we have a recorder named, we have a form of temple recommend, and temples as we know them today began in Nauvoo during this period. July 12th of 1843, a revelation of eternal marriage, including plural marriage, is first recorded, 132nd section. The revelation was not publicly announced until the saints had been in the Salt Lake Valley for five years. March 1844, President Brigham Young received the keys of Temple Sealing. April 7th of 1844, Joseph Smith taught vital doctrines as he preached at King Follett's funeral. The possibility of attaining Godhead was taught, elevating the self-understanding of all who became aware of this discourse and inspiring concept. But remember the Savior in Matthew 5 and 48 has said, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. It was a principle that they understood and taught, but it was solidified at that time and then even more so later on by Wilford Woodruff and others. Then came the death of the prophet. On July 8th of 1844, after a three-week interruption of temple construction caused by the martyrdom of the prophet and the patriarch, Work resumed on the temple. The next vital date is in January, just six months from then, when Brigham Young petitioned the Lord on what to do with the problems brought about by the increased mob threats and persecutions. And we can just imagine what was going on. Never was there a safe day for them. And yet those marvelous people would walk up the hill, sometimes a hundred in a day, to work on the Nauvoo Temple. 
April of 1845, in a unique and somewhat surprising move, Brigham Young halted missionary work in the United States to concentrate efforts upon building the temple. By this time, the mobs were burning houses everywhere. Crops were being destroyed in southern Hancock County. And Brigham Young announced that the saints would leave Illinois in the spring of 1846. This was agreed upon in October by representatives from Governor Ford's office. However, we know it didn't work out quite that way. On October 5th of 1845, Brigham Young called a conference on the first floor and dedicated the finished portions of the temple. On November 30th, 1845, attic rooms were dedicated for ordinance work. In December, on the 10th, the first endowments were accomplished by members who were allowed to have that ordinance completed. Now we're into the next year, 1846, the year where so much happened. Two young couples were first to be married in the Nauvoo Temple in Brigham Young's office on the attic level. On the 11th of this month, the sealing of children to parents began for both the deceased and those living. And now we can see at least many of the reasons why Nauvoo was such a, a, a vital temple leading to that which we're doing today. And then February 4th of 1846, the mass migration began out of Nauvoo, the coldest winter on record. The river was frozen. Many of them were able to cross on the ice. Just four days later, Brigham Young dedicated the parts of the temple that had been completed by then. It was a structure reputed to be the largest west of Cincinnati and north of St. Louis. And it was a beacon for travelers and sightseers as long as it stood. By April, the number leaving Nauvoo had increased dramatically. And by May 15th, the number of saints who had left Nauvoo probably exceeded 11,000, some say more than 12. The brief history of Nauvoo as a gathering place where temple work as we know it to be came to an end. Well, crossing Iowa, up to Council Bluffs, the few months that were spent in winter quarters was all part of the master design because on July 28, 1847, just four days after the saints had entered the valley, Brigham Young designated a site for a temple in the Salt Lake Valley, and by doing this, he wasted little time in communicating how important temple building was to the saints. Now, these next dates are those that happened just a little while ago. The period of 1862 through 1869 were dates when Nauvoo Restoration Incorporated was established. Archaeological investigation of the temple site was accomplished. All fill and evidence of post-Mormon activity, including the Icarian work, was removed, and all the original masonry preserved and stabilized. Sod was laid on the basement floor and over ridges, marking the petitions. Sand was distributed over the front base, side, and stairwells. And now the process of rebuilding the city of Nauvoo. Three other dates of which we should be aware pertaining to the Nauvoo Temple are these. President Gordon B. Hinckley went to Nauvoo on August 14th of 1982 and dedicated the four-acre temple site upon which the Nauvoo Temple would be constructed sometime in the future. We were back there with others just a few months ago, and as we walked around the temple block, he said, you know that uh, I dedicated this site for the construction of the reconstruction of the Nauvoo Temple. I said, President, I had no idea. And he told me this story. From the Temple Block site, he also dedicated 16 restored buildings to be visited by those who travel to Nauvoo. Then the date I think we shall all remember, the afternoon session of General Conference, April 4th of this year, President Hinckley announced that a temple would be constructed in Nauvoo. The ripple of excitement has continued from that time on. On Sunday, October 24th, a month and a half ago, the official groundbreaking ceremony for the reconstruction of the Nauvoo Temple 
presided over by President Gordon B. Hinckley, took place with Elder Donald L. Staley conducting the proceedings, and that was a glorious day. Now let us look at some pictures that portray the Nauvoo Temple and other things that were going on then. May we have the first. Here we have a photograph, a rare photograph of the Nauvoo Temple, although reproduced uh, by many others, showing the temple itself and the type of buildings in which they lived. Next. Here are some other views of old Nauvoo. This here is the Prophet Joseph's design and where they were, at least where they were thinking at his martyrdom. Brigham Young made these changes himself, and of course that's the way that the Nauvoo Temple appeared and will appear. Another photograph of the Nauvoo Temple. There's an artist's depiction. Next. This drawing is particularly interesting because it shows the Nauvoo Temple and how easily it was observed by those who were landing in Nauvoo as they had traveled the Mississippi River route. Sunstone of which President Hinckley said something interesting last April. When asked about them, he said, we'll cut them again just like they were cut back then. I thought perhaps they would be poured stone, but they will not. They will be made by skilled masons. Another artist depiction. Now let's compare the size of temples because this is what we're so often asked. The first transparency we have is that of Solomon's temple. There is the length, the breadth, and the height. There is the temple itself and some of the outlying area. Next, let's compare Solomon's temple to the temple at Nauvoo. Here we have two icons showing the relative size of each. If we eliminate the, the area in front of Solomon's temple, which is really not part of the temple, they're both at ground level do you see the difference? Next. Let's take a look at our smaller temples. We're using the dimensions of Edmonton, and we're showing you a picture of the Anchorage Temple. We do not yet have a picture of the Edmonton, Temp Edmonton Temple, and probably will not for another two weeks. Green is Nauvoo. The red, of course are the new temples. The reason for their length is because the baptismal font is attached or part of the temple on the same floor. If it were in the basement area, our new temples would be much smaller in size than they are. All right. Let's go to the temple that, uh, of which so many of you are aware, the Provo Temple. It's depicted in blue. Here we have all of the area surrounding it. And then we have, as you know, a very high steeple. But look how close the Nauvoo Temple will be to the height of our Provo Temple. It's amazing how large the Nauvoo Temple is. We also see the comparison between Solomon's Temple and small temples. This shows us a diagram of the attic story of Nauvoo. Celestial room, the veil, terrestrial and telestial rooms, the garden room, and of course the rooms around could be used for anything that was necessary during temple work in Nauvoo. It just didn't last very long. 
And even though they knew they had to leave, they persisted in completing it as Brigham Young would keep uh, dedicating it almost floor by floor. This shows a diagram of, the, of a small temple. It happens to be the Alaska temple. There we see the baptismal font, which has been added, which is part of it. The endowment room, celestial room, and others. Next. Here we see the Nauvoo Temple as it appeared at the time of final dedication. Incidentally, these, uh, these pictures will be part of the proceedings where you can study them in more detail, but thought you would be interested in seeing them. Here we have the dates, the roof, September 1845. The attic story dedicated November of 1845. It was during August and September at great expense that glass windows were installed. They had very little, just as the saints in Kirtland had very little. Groundbreaking date. Wooden font in 1841, the stone font for baptisms for the dead in 1845. Thank you. This is a, a model of the Nauvoo Temple as we would be looking sort of down the Mississippi and just a bit west. A beautiful building. And that is the way that it will appear Construction, as I mentioned, has already begun. Leaving the topic of the Nauvoo Temple, we look back historically to temples of earlier ages. In a book published in Philadelphia in 1849 were some fascinating comments about the early Christian church, specifically the fact that they attended the temple to perform certain defined religious tasks. Not many other details were mentioned. But the text stated in this book that was printed in 1849, speaking of the early Christians, they kept close to holy ordinances and abounded in all instances of piety and devotion. For Christianity, admitted in the power of it, will dispose the soul to communion with God. The author had some pretty good information to share. In all those ways wherein he hath appointed us to meet him and promised to meet us. And then he completed with these words. Furthermore, they were diligent and constant in their attention on preaching of the word, continued in the apostles' doctrine, or as it may be read, continued constant to the apostles' teachings and instructions, just as we are today. They had fellowship with one another in religious worship. The temple was their place of rendezvous. And though they met with the Jews in the courts of the temple, yet the Christians kept together by themselves and were unanimous in their separate devotions." End of quote. In a book titled The Land and the Book, Southern Palestine and Jerusalem, an author by the name of William H. Thompson, Doctor of Divinity, who had been a missionary in Syrian Palestine for 45 years, spent a great deal of time studying the temples found in that part of the world. I located these books while we lived in Pennsylvania some 25 years ago. A church had closed there, and they had a number of books, a uh, hundred years old or more, and... and uh, uh, we were fortunate to have obtained them. In this book, the author refers to a number of temples observed as he traveled in the area there and makes 50 additional references to the temple at Jerusalem. May I emphasize this point? There are many buildings that carry the designation of temple then as now. Along with others, we have Masonic temples, Buddhist temples, they had their temples of Jupiter and a number of sub-temples and the temple at Jerusalem. 
But it is doubtful that temple work as we know it was going on during much of that period. But it does seem as if whenever the Lord has had a people on earth who will obey his word, they have been commanded to build temples in which the ordinances of the gospel and other special manifestations that pertain to exaltation and eternal life may be administered. It further appears that from Father Adam's time to the beginning of the Savior's ministry, ordinances were performed in temples for the living only. We have every reason to believe that uh, ordinances performed for the dead began during the days of the Savior. My wife and I traveled a bit in southern Europe several years ago, and as we would visit those ancient churches there, often a guide would say, and here is the baptismal font, where baptisms for the dead occurred. In cases of extreme poverty or emergencies, these ordinances may sometimes be done on a mountaintop or in a river such as the Mississippi, in an endowment house such as was built in Salt Lake, or in a partially completed building as was the Nauvoo Temple when it was being used for ordinances at times of great stress. This may have been the case with Mount Sinai where Moses obtained the laws of Israel, communicated with the Lord, and learned that he was to make a sanctuary where Jehovah would dwell among them. And what about the Mount of Transfiguration, brothers and sisters, where the Master took and then instructed Peter, James, and John? The Father revealed his voice to them, declaring, the love and pride he had in his son. Moses and Elias appeared and also communicated with them. Going back to earlier times, the tabernacle erected by Moses was a type of portable temple since the Israelites were traveling in the wilderness and not in a position to build a more permanent structure. The best-known temple mentioned in the Bible was built in Jerusalem during the time of Solomon, a fact of which we're all aware. This temple was partially destroyed in approximately 600 B.C., an interesting time for those of us who have studied and loved the Book of Mormon. It was restored by Zerubbabel nearly a century later. This temple was burned in 37 B.C., and its reconstruction continued to 64 A.D. Herod the Great, in his attempt to win friends and influence people. In his attempt to be well-liked and to be perceived as one who could resonate with the needs of the Jews, had begun the construction by motivating the early part of the project. Construction continued through all of the Savior's life and was not completed, as mentioned, until A.D. 64. It is known as Herod's Temple today. The Romans destroyed the temple just six years later, The location of the Temple of Solomon on the hill of Zion appears to have been been selected by God as his dwelling place early in David's reign. Solomon, David's son, capitalized on what his father had done in recruiting skilled workmen and obtained uh, precious materials that were needed, leading to Solomon receiving much of the credit for the construction. The dimensions of the temple and many of the materials that were utilized are well defined in the Old Testament. I'm sure you've probably read them. It appears at least some living ordinances were for, were performed at the Temple of Solomon as were performed in the Temple of Zerubbabel. Well, what about the temple? What about the temples then? Was it a valid temple? during those days, pre-Christian era, and perhaps when the Savior walked the world? Well, perhaps, but the evidence is in conflict. Because the temple obviously was a point of focus, it was also a place that those who attacked Jerusalem felt compelled to destroy. With the absence of prophets during part of the period, I suspect that it was not an ordained temple such as we know today. It is easier, I think more comfortable, to think that much of the time that worship was going on in that temple was of a counterfeit nature. 
but it does remain the prime sacred place of the Samaritan community. Isn't it interesting that we learn with biblically mentioned temples the kind of suffering and persecutions that we can understand today only by comparing the devastating difficulties encountered in Nauvoo and Kirtland uh, from about 1831 to 1846. As a protection to his followers, perhaps the Savior then, during the latter part of his ministry, had designated another place for temple worship in a building that was either constructed or given to him and his followers during the latter part of his personal reign in the Holy Land. After observing the deep interest that deity is focused upon temple work, it seems evident that such activity did transpire during the Master's reign. Yes, it must have taken place just as Malachi defined it would and was operational during the life of Jesus. I have carefully studied other references to the temple. Many of them appear to be speaking of a, temple, of a temple where true temple worship took place, including the making of covenants and participating in ordinances. As we know, a building called a temple doesn't automatically imply that ordinances and covenants or other divinely revealed activities took place there, just as there are many different buildings called temples today where our revealed temple work does not occur. Is it reasonable, brothers and sisters, to assume that the same was true in the days of our Redeemer's mortal ministry? It is also interesting to note the familiarity with the temple that members of the early Christian the church seemed to possess during and after the Savior's reign. For example, Matthew and others wrote that during the time of the Savior's atonement and resurrection, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, mentioned by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The event surrounding the death of the Redeemer, Luke wrote that after the ascension, many members returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. But which temple? What building? Also, after the day of Pentecost, Luke reported that the members were continuing daily with one accord in the temple. But which temple? We also know that the Savior spent a great deal of time at the temple, even though he did not, as we all know, organize and lead a church that would have had any vested interest in the temple at Jerusalem, other than that which he declared at least early in his ministry. What may be supposed? Could it be possible that perhaps they, in almost an endowment house manner, had constructed or somehow obtained their own temple for ordinance work? Could they have had another building apart from the historic temple that Jesus visited as a 12-year-old child and where during the feast of the Passover Jesus taught there, at least to the time when he overthrew the, temples, the tables in the temple and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves, signifying that they had rendered the temple perhaps unusable for divine sacred ordinances and covenants. Probably the Christian temple, if this supposition is valid, was not elaborate. Perhaps, as mentioned earlier, one of the early Christians with resources has provided a building for them, or they utilized a home for temple worship. But we certainly would have no reason to believe that the early saints, as pure and true Christians, would have been welcome in the temple that Herod had rebuilt, although much of it was a public courtyard. The Savior had disrupted their money-making functions there. And even though we suspect they quickly returned to their building and to the selling of sacrificial birds and animals, those who were obviously following Jesus would probably not have been allowed there in the inner 
most sacred areas for the eternal and detailed ordinance work that at least part had been practiced during Old Testament times or during the meridian of time when they were there or now beginning with the Nauvoo period. This is simply a personal approach that logically seems to explain the flexibilities that early saints seemed to have in their temple orientation and worship. They were comfortable going there. They rejoiced there. They went there often. But again, which building? Further yet, uh, periphery evidence addresses the topic of temple worship by recalling a statement made by the Savior that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and the prophets, to include Malachi, and in the Psalms concerning me. Would not a complete temple service be included if that's what we do today and if that's what it appears they did then let us summarize what we have uh, where we have been thus far we have looked at the effective nudging of our prophet in uh, changing the the church's focus and future through temple building we reviewed the history of the Nauvoo temple and looked at its influence to the modern church to us today we then exampled temple worship in the early Christian era and postulated there might have been a Christian temple apart from Herod's temple. Yes, probably was more, there was more going on in temple worship than is generally assumed. This review provides us with a context to now discuss in the time we have left the doctrine and purposes and benefits of temple work. The basic doctrine surrounding our use of the temple is found throughout deities recorded interactions with his children residing on earth. One early example is when the Lord commanded Moses to build a tabernacle and then to build a house of the Lord in the land of promise. This command was to provide a place that those ordinances might be revealed which had been hid from before the world was, 124th section. We have been commanded to accomplish certain tasks on earth that allow us to perform sacred ordinances and to make associated covenants. These ordinances can only be performed in temples by those in the flesh who are qualified to do so. These include anointings and washings, baptisms for the dead, solemn assemblies, again endowments, the ordinance of, internal, of eternal sealing. In an interesting series of verses written just prior to the Christian era, Malachi partially delineates these responsibilities when he in a prophetic manner wrote, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And even from the days of your fathers ye are gone from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Messenger, ordinances, covenants, the second coming of the Master who will suddenly come to his temple. And the fact the Lord does not change are recorded in just three verses of the third chapter of Malachi. Well, we know some of the background in the early church pertaining to baptisms for the dead. And we shall jump over a number of that now and talk about what I have learned by study and research and practice and observation about the purposes and reasons for our temple. Number one, and by far the most important as it relates to us personally, is our own ordinances and covenants. Because Jehovah served under the direction of Elohim and subjected, subjected himself to his will, he declared the necessity of our personally obtaining and making earthly ordinances and covenants in a temple. No other purpose for a temple in our own lives is needed, nor as important, although there are many other reasons. This overarching necessity leads to the second purpose, 
work for the dead, where we go into the temples of the Lord and we do work for those who could not, did not, or would not perform their own temple work while they were living here in the world. Perhaps a lack of understanding or maybe a geographical challenge that they couldn't overcome. This includes the gift of uh, the Holy Ghost being given by proxy as Talmage taught. We know they are taught the gospel in the life hereafter because the Savior said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Peter added, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And then it went on to say, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Remember the Lord inquired of Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? But in the maturity of our own thinking and knowledge, we know we are our brother's keeper. And that's why we do our brother and sisters, brothers and sisters work for them in the temple. Everything is different for those in the spirit world because it is there where redemption for the dead takes place because of the vicarious service we perform for them in temples. We also learn that it's possible to repent after death. Next, eternal ceilings of a marriage. The temple provides an eternal perspective and promise to marriage which is lacking in the too often frivolous weddings outside of these structures. The sealing ceremony removes the world from marriage and for a brief time should certainly be the most important moment in a couple's life. The most grand of all promises is that a couple will have each other and their children forever. What greater promise is there in life than that of an eternal family? Once an individual experiences the temple, he or she becomes more sensitive to everything that's worthwhile, and I submit this is the fourth reason. We view every facet of life differently not only more clearly, but also with an eternal perspective that alters everything we do, think, and are. The temple helps us define the way we treat people, the way we think and dream about life and eternity, the way we plan and teach and enjoy our families, the friends we have, the places we love, the things we do, the prayers we say, the love we give to others. Next, the temple is a marvelous place in which to serve. Often those that are older, who might be living lives not quite as productive as they are when they're in the temple, go there. And let me give you some examples. 450 individuals serve in the Denver temple. There are 3,600 of our brothers and sisters now serving in the Jordan River temple. In the Provo temple, 2,868 men and women are assisting there in conducting 47 sessions per day, and that's the most in the church. There are about 1,250 serving the Mount Tipanogos Temple. As few as 40 serve in small temples. 500 serve in the Chicago Temple, often having to travel hundreds of miles to get there to accomplish the task they have promised to do. The Salt Lake Temple is blessed with 2,400 individuals who assist with live endowment sessions and other tasks that take place there. Number six, we obtain a temple recommend annually in order to go to a temple. It is a significant opportunity to sit with our ecclesiastical leaders and report to them our worthiness and our desire to go to the temple. A recommend becomes a miniature security blanket, brothers and sisters, to remind us remind us that we desire to continue to participate in that which matters most. Once obtained, we should not want to be found without one. What an ingenious, spiritually motivated concept. Because it is such a privilege to enter a holy temple, 
As President Boyd K. Packer wrote, you should know the things that are required of you and understand the doctrine that underlies the work that is performed in the house of the Lord. Next, each time we go, we learn something new. I took a young man through the temple as his escort a few days ago, a young man who had lost his father in a tragic accident. I was fascinated how much he was learning, but I was also interested that it was a new experience for me, even though I had done it so many times. It is a time where we reflect positively upon things that matter most. Everyone has problems. We often feel alone in our pain and confusion. But that's not truly the case. Others are having challenges too. And so as we go in the temple, it's a place to make decisions and solve these problems while taking groups through the open house sessions up in Edmonton. What so many of the people that had not been in a temple were interested in is the fact that we have all those chairs sitting around where people can come and there think and meditate and pray. In 2 Samuel 22 and 7, we read the words of David, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter his ears. Next, it is within the walls of our temples that we understand the mission of Satan and his focus upon disrupting, injuring, and destroying. It's graphically taught. I don't know of anywhere we can go to find out more about that part of life and how we can avoid it in our own lives. Next, a temple is a place where the Savior and other divine messengers such as Moses, Elijah, and Elijah have visited and communicated. It is where keys were restored again upon the earth. It is where the Master visits when he is here. The temple is a building that provides a powerful external and internal spiritual focus in our existence for all who desire the temple. It reminds us of the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. For our singles, the temple is a place to frequent and to mingle before and after attending a session. It provides a location where potential eternal partners who have been pre-qualified by their bishops and branch presidents as it pertains to worthiness can go to meet others with similar directions. What happens to one's eternal self, whether single or not, when the temple becomes a substituting experience for TV or other forms of potentially time-wasting activity? Next, almost everything that happens within a temple, including its location, is designed and led and revealed and taught by our prophet. No buildings in the kingdom have more prayerful activities surrounding them. Sacrifice becomes one of life's greatest blessings. We talk there about the Garden of Eden, the first sanctuary. The temple reminds us that repentance is possible. Temples help us understand more deeply the power and necessity of the Melchizedek priesthood. We are taught how the priesthood is shared eternally and that the creative process of the heavens, the earth, and man came about through the power of the priesthood. The temple provides a, rem a marvelous reminder that, that, women, that woman is the equal and help meet of man. Both genders make the same covenants, obtain the same ordinances. Our sisters and brothers fall under identical promises and future opportunities that are explained there. But at the same time, the house of the Lord reminds us all that we are equal in God's eyes. We dress the same, we hear the same words spoken, see the same visual promptings, and we observe worldwide that everyone is Elohim's son, or daughter. Incidentally, it's uh, fascinating to know that we have sound equipment where in some sessions eight languages are spoken through electronic devices, all communicating the same wisdom and doctrine. The temple ceremony is recorded in 47 languages. 
Next, the temple teaches us that there are no limitations to our eternal lives. Those of us that uh, work with those that have lost their temple and priesthood privileges often learn that it was the temple that motivated those men and women to want to return to full activity. It is truly a unique form of worship. No other belief system shares this activity. It is the purest form of godliness found on the earth. It is a school of divinity where we learn what Heavenly Father wants us to know and to do. I was disrupted several times up in Edmonton by, by our visitors asking, well, what type of theological seminary do you go to? We talked a little bit about the training we receive in the church, but I also mentioned that the temple helps us understand what we are to do. The anticipation of going to the temple adds so much to life. Something we're learning right now, brothers and sisters, is the temple is a tremendous, powerful tool of retention. Where back not that many years ago, a convert would be in a village somewhere north or south, never hoping to have sufficient uh, means to go to a temple. And under divine guidance, of course, we're taking the temples to them instead of having them come to the temple. Brothers and sisters, I hope that today we have learned and relearned some important principles. There is much yet to become aware, to become aware of and knowing what we need to know about this glorious activity. However, in all of our learning, let us remember that learning does not usually count as much in the Lord's eyes as being. That is the power of the temple that we not only learn, but we also change, repent, and grow. We become more tender and sensitive and focused. Remember that it is the ordinances of the temple that we are placed under covenant to him. It is there that we become a covenant people. May each of us study to understand what these buildings of miracles can do for us and for those we love the most and for those departed, and for the church itself. May we take time in our busy schedules to enter within them and be reminded that we are inordinately blessed in so doing. Yes, we are the church restored, and that implication alone testifies that temples are to be a vital focus of our religious experience, as this dispensation has linked the earliest of times to the next millennium in which we will be living in just 28 days. I testify to you that he, our Redeemer, lives, that Elohim, our Father, cares for each of us, and that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of truth with the Father and the Son, will lead us to happiness and peace now and joy unspeakable in the life to be. I testify in that world we will hear the voices, we will hear their voices, and if we live as he has advised us to live, because we love him, we will be with them forever. May we personally never leave our temples unattended. I ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Master. Amen.